parties can agree, they can negotiate, they can change the legal positions consensually, but no one party is entitled to unilaterally modify the legal position of the other. The fourth point is that the court saw its role as enforcing the rights of the parties, a role that's relatively passive. I don't mean to suggest it's entirely passive, I just relatively passive, relative to what? Relative to what we're going to see a little bit later. It's the fourth point. The fifth point is a corollary of the above, and it's important to see that it is a corollary. The court didn't consider the public interest. And well, why is this a corollary? It's a corollary because, again, as we'll see later, if the court had considered the public interest, none of the other four points could have been true. Okay, now, again, you might think that the rights should be different than what they are. People should have different rights than the, the ones that applied in these cases. That's possible. But the key point I want to make in relation to this way of deciding cases is that it, it's a way that respects what I call the moral standing of the parties. And I need to spend just a little bit of time explaining what I mean by this idea of moral standing. Okay, it's an idea that, that I think you find, well, you find it all over the place, but, but it's not never very clearly defined the, 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 elsewhere. The clearest definition I think you get is in someone like Hegel's conception of a, a civil society. But uh, anyway, for what that's worth, the, my idea is that the moral standing of an individual is recognised in a society if and only if two things. One, the liberty of individuals and to say their rights and duties and to say is recognised. So in order to have moral standing in a society, the society must recognise that I have rights and that those rights apply, I hold against other people. Okay, but that's only the first point. The second point is that individuals have access to a forum in which they are able to assert their rights against other individuals. Um, and th this, point, uh, this point is the most crucial one, I think, for me. That, so to have moral standing, it's not just enough that I have rights, I have to be able to enforce them. Uh, I have to be able to go to a forum and insist that those rights get recognised. It's not good enough if, what I, if, if I have rights, they recognise, but in order to get them enforced, I have to go and ask someone to enforce them. Would you please enforce my rights for me? And that person has some discretionary authority to determine whether, whether, the, whether the body would do so or not. And I think, in fact, in a way, I think just describing this value, you can probably already see what I'm going to say about the modern law in this connection. Because it seems to me the whole trend of the modern law is to deny me precisely this, uh, this value. So even if, even if the modern law does recognise me as a rights holder, the idea that I can go to court and demand that those rights be recognised, that's much less fashionable. Anyway, okay, so that's what I mean by moral standing. And what I want to say is that this value is respected by the approach, what we might call the traditional approach to the law of nuisance that we've been considering. The, the traditional approach doesn't just give me rights, uh, it allows me to go to court and enforce, and enforce them. And the court sees its job as, as uh, providing such. Now I want to compare this with uh, more modern cases, examples. Uh, first of all, with the regime created by um, New Zealand's Resource Management Act. And the first thing I want to do here is just explain why have I chosen this example, or why have I come halfway around the world to talk about New Zealand's Resource Management Act. Um, a number of interconnected reasons. The first is this is actually the case that brought the issues that I want to talk about to my attention. Um, and the reason that brought the issues to my attention is I just happened to go out to dinner with people who were complaining about the act in ways that I'm going to translate into the language of uh, modern sort of legal theory. Um, they were, but people were saying the kind of things that I'm going to talk about later. And this, this opened my eyes to, uh, to the problems and, and enabled me to crystallise what the vague thoughts that I had about uh, the problem with the way that the modern law operates. So uh, and I'm, as a result, I'm, I'm familiar with how this stuff actually works. Not familiar in the way that, say, the Australian Research Council would want me to be familiar, which is about you know, contacting industry partners where they are, uh, and asking them how this affects them. I mean, I just spoke to people at, over dinner at parties and so forth, and uh, discussed how, how, these, how this has impacted on their life. Now, it's all anecdotal, of course, but I, I hope that all the more valuable for that. Um, now, I, I need to say, what I'm going to say is quite negative about the Act, but I'm not in any way examining the Act per se. What I'm doing is only looking at how the Act deals with the 
particular kind of example that we're uh, dealing with, where neighbours have got a dispute, how is that dispute to be settled? I mean, whether it's a, a good system for organising environmental management, that's, I don't want to talk about that at all. Okay, all right, so we've got our example. I want, to, I want to build up on my land, you want to stop me, how is that dispute going to be dealt with under the Act? Well, first of all, there's a test in the Act. Um, we have to ask, would, the, would my building up have an effect on you that is, quote, minor or more than minor, but not less than minor? That's a typically stupid way, that's typically stupid for drafting, statute drafting, a typically stupid way of asking, would it be at least minor? If it's not even minor, if the effect on you would not even be minor, then you're, you're out of the loop. You've got to have any say in whether I can fill up or I can just go ahead, assuming that it's not going to affect anybody else, there's no environment, but I can just go ahead. But if the effect on you is going to be at least minor, then you gain what's called affected person status under the Act. And if you are an affected person, you have a say in whether I can go ahead and build. Now, of course, it doesn't take much. This is a pretty low threshold. Right? If, if the effect on you is at least minor, right, then you get a say. And that would just be, you know, it blocks your view. It means that your washing is going to take an extra half hour to dry, whatever. Um, I mean, lots of things count, actually. Just even things like you won't even see. Uh, well, it depends where you live, but there are places, especially if you're living in a high-density area, if you're just sort of uh, paving in some of your backyard because you want to build a barbecue area or something, that might have an effect on the drainage. Um, of your uh, property and um, that, that cause more stormwater to bubble. Right, so all sorts of things can count depending on where you live. Okay, all right. So if you if you are an affected person, then that gives you a say in whether you can build. Now, if whether I can build. Now, if you are an affected person, I've got two choices. I can proceed to the next stage, which I'll talk about in a minute. It's likely to be a hearing, or I can try and get your written consent. Now, if I get your written consent to what I want to do, then as long as no one else is affected and there's no significant environmental impact, it's likely that I'll be able to go ahead with what I want to do. If I don't get your written consent, then it's likely that the case will go to a hearing and you'll be able to make submissions to the hearing. Um, now, I can only say it's likely, that all this stuff is likely, because the deciding body has a, has a discretion to determine what the result will be. Okay, now... I, on the face of it, under ordinary circumstances, I want to get your written consent because if I don't, it'll go to a hearing and I have to pay for the hearing and it's expensive. Um, it might cost me something like uh, the equivalent of £500 uh, to, for, to pay for the hearing and I mean I might only be doing 60 quid's worth of work, right? so it's pretty significant. Um, okay, so that leads to the question, on what basis then are you entitled to refuse to give written consent? And the answer is on any basis at all. I mean, you can refuse because you don't like me, because you, you just not, you know, you, you enjoy the look on my face. When you refuse written consent, you're just that kind of person, so on. All of that's fine. Um, and that might sound a bit surprising, but if you think about it, I think it has to be that way, because if there were only some grounds upon which you're entitled to refuse consent, then your refusal to give consent would be in some way just this more. Uh, and it can't be, you couldn't have, I mean the system's inefficient enough as it is, but if you were building in uh, the ability to uh, take various kinds of action, various appeals, or whatever, however we're going to describe this, right at the beginning, then it would, the whole thing would just grow into a hole. So it has to be the case that you can refuse to give consent on any basis uh, whatsoever. And that's a big problem for me, and indeed for the people that I spoke to, because it makes, in our example, it makes me beholden to you I don't have rights that I can stand on in this regard. On the contrary, you have a discretionary power over me. And I think this is very deeply resented by people uh, who I've spoken to. Okay, now I think this fact is explicitly recognised in a, it's the most ironic and disappointing, but I guess this is what one should expect, pamphlet produced by the Ministry of the Environment. But they've put out a pamphlet to sort of, you know, help people figure out what they ought to be doing in these circumstances. And the pamphlet's entitled, Your Rights as an Affected Person, which must be one of the most ironically titled uh, um, pamphlets ever produced by any government. I mean, because as we'll see, I don't think no one has any rights here at all. But anyway, what the pamphlet says, they write, this is right at the end of the pamphlet, in, in bold and highlighted text, 
It says, remember that refusing to give your written approval when you're not especially concerned about what is proposed, and it doesn't 